Well, today we're going to look at the same passage, this wonderful passage from 1 Thessalonians 4, concentrating on Jesus' return to earth. And our text for today tells us quite a bit about what we want and need to know about Jesus' return. And you might wonder, though, why does Jesus have to return at all? Isn't heaven supposed to be perfect? Why don't we just, when we die, just go to heaven? Why does Jesus have to come back? Good question. So stay tuned, because we're going to talk about that here. Right, but before we study this text together, let me first review briefly to provide some context that I hope informs the way that the first audience in Thessalonica would have received this message and informs how we should receive it today as well. Much like we experience in our day and age, the Christians of Thessalonica lived amongst people who didn't believe the gospel. People who worshipped idols and false gods. People who hoped in vain about a life or a lack of life after death. And our passage for today presses specifically into this, this discouragement this young but growing church felt about those who had died. Paul hopes to encourage them and us to have courage in the face of death. They needed facts and not speculation. Gospel truth in a world of disbelief and false hope. Recall earlier in Paul's letter where Paul writes, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. One thinks, of course, of Stephen, for example. Remember from the book of Acts in the beginning church in Jerusalem where he was martyred by the Sanhedrin and the Jews for his witness and his faith seems that likely that some of the Christians in this early church in Thessalonica were being killed, perhaps, by their watching world, killed for their witness, killed for their faith. Many in the church in Thessalonica itself were confused about the end of times and Christ's return to earth from heaven. And we live in such a time as this, in a culture that makes us sad, in a world where we worry about the future and so many are fearful and wrongly informed about death and life after death, heaven, and Jesus' return. Paul tells us his overarching purpose in this letter in chapter 3, where he writes, "Now Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all His saints." Paul's motivation in this message is to encourage the church in the truth of the gospel and to set straight in unambiguous and common terms Christ's return to earth so that they can love each other and the world in which they live. Why does Jesus have to return to the earth in bodily form to complete his mission? And how, if not when, does he come back to us? Christians, be encouraged in life and death, because our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ is returning to the earth to bring all the faithful with Him into the consummated kingdom of God. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18, God encourages His people to love one another and their world in three parts. As Paul describes, number one, Christ's return is personal. Number two, Christ's return is public. Number three, Christ's return is permanent. Now, firstly, Christ's return is personal. Death is an enemy. It is the enemy, isn't it? It's a universal problem. While some in our day and age might try to suggest otherwise, right, that death somehow is just a natural progression of life, right? We don't have to worry about it. I refer to death as the enemy because the Bible does. What's the Bible call death an enemy? And death is hard for us, regardless of your worldview or faith, isn't it? And it seems as we age that we are increasingly faced with death or the prospect of death. I don't remember thinking so much about death when I was younger, right? I mean, you know, in 2022 alone for me, just working as a pastor, I participated in five memorial services. And in all of them, we grieved, some more, some less, And death is personal for all people because all people, with the exceptions of Enoch and Elijah in the Old Testament, who had the fortunate experience of going to heaven without dying, right? All people will die. 
and have or have died unless Jesus returns beforehand, right? And yet there's different ways in which the people of our world engage the concept and prospect of death and try to remain hopeful in the face of death or life after death. There's different ways we engage that. One of the more common ones Dave touched on last week, people deal with death as a stoic. You know, a stoic is a stoic's a person who actually is able to endure hardship without complaining much. In this approach, death's acknowledged is hard, grieving worthwhile, but the best thing to do is to look at the bright side and just kind of suck it up, right? Push down your emotions and don't give in to them. Deal with it. Keep a stiff upper lip, as my dad always said to me. I can't help but think of the recent death of David Crosby. You guys probably encountered that in the news or listened to David Crosby songs. I I really enjoyed his music, right? CNN reported this regarding the singer's death. It's with great sadness after a long illness that our beloved David Crosby has passed away. He's lovingly surrounded by his wife and soulmate Jan and son Django. Although he's no longer here with us, his humanity and kind soul will continue to guide and inspire us. His legacy will continue to live on through his legendary music, CNN reported. This report sounds kind of stoic, doesn't it? You know, and it contains most, if not all, of the components of a, of a uh, condolence letter, right? Or a Hallmark card, as I think Dave called it last week, right? Death happens. It happens. It ends suffering for the deceased from a long illness here, but it creates challenges and suffering for family and friends. But don't despair too much, right? Don't despair too much because the memory of this great human being and his kind soul will live on in his legacy. Naive optimism, if not outright despair, grief without real hope, as Paul will tell us here. But there are other ways in which people deal with death in our day and age that are more enlightened, if not modern. You know, for some people, deny that death is an enemy at all. They just deny it, right? It's natural. It's just your next phase of existence. You know, you may have heard of this, right? You can take your loved one's remains and plant a garden or plant a tree. You can even get to pick the tree out when somebody dies, right? It's all biodegradable and natural. You know, you die and simply go to sleep and are annihilated, so it really doesn't matter, right? We just go back to the earth. Why do we, what do we have to be afraid of? That's natural. No worries. You know, but deep down, deep down in all of the recesses of our hearts and minds, we know it isn't true. As we age and we get closer to death, sometimes we feel like we're driving a car with all of the windows of the car completely blackened out at 60 miles an hour. You ever feel that way? Hmm? We're scared. We're scared when we get certain diagnoses. We loathe the thought of death, let alone death itself. And And the question is, why? Why do we feel that way? We're scared of death because it's not right. It's unnatural. And for many, life after death is uncertain, which adds to their fear, right? What happens? What happens when you die? 18th century Romanticist thinker Jean-Jacques Rousseau, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Of course, he said this in French, so it would have been much more eloquent, but this is the English translation. He was an Enlightenment Romanticist thinker in the 18th century, right? He said, he who pretends to look upon death apart from fear lies. And Paul's purpose here in this letter is pastoral. It's to set the record straight. It's to encourage this growing but confused church in the truth of the gospel and the peace-evoking reality of death leading to life in heaven and to the earth when Jesus Christ returns. To the text... 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 15 again, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who do have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you with a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Notice what Paul says here. He doesn't say to not grieve, does he? He doesn't say that grieving is bad at death. He just says we should grieve without hope. We should grieve death. Death should anger us. You know, you think about Jesus Christ's response in La- in, uh, to Lazarus' death in John chapter 11. You remember, you remember how Jesus responded to that? The text says he was greatly troubled 
and he wept at the death. God's telling us there through Jesus, the God man, death stinks. That's not natural. And Paul tells us here, what's our immediate response to grief? How do we think well about it? Paul tells us here in this passage, you have to mix hope in with the grief. To not grieve is wrong, it's unhealthy, but we need real hope, real hope. Not the false hope of naive, wishful thinking or an enlightened approach denouncing the obvious. And this initial life after death is in a state of perpetual sleep, but a conscious, even if disembodied existence, as Dave helped us realize last week, right? You don't just go to sleep when you die. You're conscious. The Bible, the New Testament tells us recurrently, it's a conscious state. So what do we do in this conscious but disembodied state in the intermediate state of heaven? What's heaven like? How's our understanding of it give us hope in dying? Well, speculation abounds. Many books are near death or coming back from death. Stories have been written. You might have encountered some of these. But what's the Bible tell us about heaven in this intermediate state? Well, what we can know for sure is it's a different reality to that which we experience here, even as Christians. Heaven's a real place, right? Genesis 1-1, the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Heaven is a place. And it's a place of purity, praise, peace, and pining. Let me explain. According to the Bible, when Christians come to faith in Christ during their earthly life, we are freed from the guilt of our sin, but only upon our death and going up to heaven are we actually liberated from sin's presence. You see, heaven is a place of absolute holiness and uncompromising purity. And we praise, we'll praise the Lord in heaven like we never will have been able to before, right? Because we'll be with him and we can see him as we've, as we've never been able to see him before. Purity and praise. But it's also a place of incredible peace, right? In heaven, our fight will be over. Paul says, I fought the good fight before he goes to heaven. I finished the race. Our struggle will have ended. It's a place of peace. And yet this state, while considerably better than our current circumstances, is not the best state that God has intended for us. The heavenly realm is not the ultimate reality that God intends. Why? Why, is, why can't we just go to heaven and that be enough? Well, there's at least three reasons. And I'm going to touch on them briefly here. The first is you're disembodied, right? Chris maybe is physical Chris guy, whatever that is now, balding and getting old for sure, but... Um, I, I, you know, I'm physical, I'm a physical being, but I'm also my spiritual uh, spirit and soul or the immaterial parts of my being. I'm not one without the other. It, you can't reduce them to the two. When we go to heaven, it's incomplete because it's a disembodied state. We're not with our bodies. That's the first reason. Second reason is creation is groaning. God created the creation good and he created it for his glory and for our enjoyment, Right. Paul in the book of Romans in chapter 8 gives us this text, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who've had the first fruit of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemptions of our body. You see, creation is groaning with our sin. We experience that in the way the crazy weather is oftentimes, right? Creation isn't happy. It's because of our sin. God's going to recreate, you know, this earth when he returns, when Jesus returns. But there's a third reason that heaven isn't our final destiny. And what we might not have considered is that in heaven, it's a place of pining, pining. I had to look that up. Um, it's not, a, it, you know, in heaven, you're not going to be like looking for conifer trees or something, you know, and be like a pining guy. But... No, heaven in heaven pining means the second dictionary definition in Merriam-Webster's of yearning intensely and persistently. Heaven is a place of yearning persistently, right? In heaven, they'll be yearning. Well, you might ask, what are we going to be yearning for in heaven? You know, well, we'll probably be yearning in some sense for, for, for us to be walking around in glorified bodies, which we'll get when Christ returns. And we're going to, you know, be yearning in some sense for God to recreate creation without its groaning for us. But in addition, we're going to be yearning for justice in heaven. Justice. Heaven, there's a strong yearning for justice. Paul Wolf, the author of Setting Our Sights on Heaven, puts it this way. 
But God's purpose for the present is to delay the righting of all wrongs until the day is appointed, which means that all his children, even those who have already reached heaven, must wait until some of their desires are satisfied. Let's look at two texts from the Bible that seem to inform this view. From the book of Revelation, uh, Shelby, just, or Shelby in our class just reviewed this text today from uh, Revelation 6.10. The voice of the martyrs, those who had witnessed their faith, are in heaven. And they yell out with a loud voice to God. They cry out, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you'll judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Yearning for justice. Even Christ can be described as waiting for the day when he returns to judge the world. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, the, Hebrew, uh, the author of Hebrews in chapter 10 tells us, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. Christ himself and his saints in heaven are waiting, yes, but they do so in confidence, patience, and zeal. And while there's really no sadness in heaven per se, there seems to remain a yearning for the return of Christ to make everything right to consummate his kingdom and to judge the living and the dead. And it's these who've died in faith, those that are living in this constant state of purity, praise, peace, and pining in heaven that the Lord resurrects and brings with him when he returns. Can you just imagine and imagine the excitement and the joy of the saints in heaven returning to earth, knowing that all wrongs will be made right, knowing that those who denounced and persecuted them as fools for believing in Jesus would be brought to their knees. And we can be certain of Jesus' return because Jesus died and rose again from the dead before he ascended to heaven. You know, and if that's not enough, we gain more certainty in Jesus' return because Jesus tells us himself he's going to return. You may recall from the Olivet Discourse, there's three accounts in the Gospels, one in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? But from Matthew's account, chapter 24, starting in 29, we read these verses. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven. The powers of heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Paul can unambiguously exclaim that Jesus will return because Jesus said so prior to being resurrected from the dead. And this is our source of great hope, you see. We don't need to be stoic upon death. We don't need to approach death as if it doesn't matter in this modern approach, trying to minimize what death is or pretend that it doesn't really matter. We should grieve death we should be angry with death, and yet we shouldn't be afraid to go towards it, you see. How do we personally face death with confidence and hope? Well, you can't just make stuff up. And you can't just, okay, well, I kind of want it to be like this, so I'm just going to kind of start making stuff up and try and think of the bright side, right? It's a fact. God doesn't keep any of us from death. And we all deserve to die because we're all sinners, but we can face it with confidence because he redeems death for us when we put our trust in Jesus by faith. Let's look at another text where Paul lays out this future personal expectation and the sequence of events for all believers at Christ's return when he wrote to the church in Corinth from chapter 15 of his first letter, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ, the firstfruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. You see, friends, the dead are resurrected when Christ returns. The people in Thessalonica were confused as much as they were concerned because they thought what Christ was going to return during their lifetime. And they believed that those that were in the church that died before Jesus came back were not going to participate in and experience Jesus' return in glory to the same extent that they were going to. So they were scared. They were concerned, you see. No, Paul says. He says no. Those that have died in Christ will come before those who are still alive at His return. 
They'll have the position of honor at the parade when we welcome Christ back. So yes, be encouraged, friends, because Christ's return to earth is personal, whether you're alive at the time he returns or you're dead. But it isn't just for you alone. It's going to be for the whole world because when Christ returns, it's going to be a public event. Over the last several centuries, the church broadly has debated not only when Christ will return, but how. What I hope you see is that Paul in this text clearly conceives of the resurrection of the saints and the catching up of believers to meet the Lord in the air occurring at the same time Christ returns definitively to judge the earth. Because this event is not only not secret, but it's overtly and comprehensively public. Back to the text in verse 16, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with the cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet. Doesn't sound secret. Paul says again, with the cry of a command, the voice of an archangel, and the sound of the trumpet, announcing to the world the return of its king, Jesus descends from heaven. Kim Riddleberger, uh, wittily, if not polemically, I don't know if you've ever read him, but um, he's a fun one. Anyway, he's a pastor theologian in, in uh, the Reformed tradition. He writes this about this verse, verse 16 in chapter 4. The entire thrust of the threefold announcement is that God himself will proclaim the return of Jesus Christ so loudly that the whole world will hear. Not only so, but the world will also witness the subsequent catching away of believers. If other Christians are correct in saying that this coming is a secret, then only believers will hear the divine declaration. This turns the thrice repeated announcement of Christ's return into something akin to a cosmic dog whistle. What's worse, if they're correct about a secret rapture, then Jesus does not have two advents but three. And of course, many Christians have not only pondered the secret return of Christ, but who will be taken and who will be left behind. But Jesus' words, again, from the Olivet Discord helped to clarify that concern. Again, from Matthew's account in chapter 24, starting in verse 31. And he'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they'll gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. But concerning that day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as, were the, for as were in the days of Noah, so will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. They were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Therefore you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Do you see? Matthew says... Because Jesus did, that when Jesus returns, it'll be like the time of Noah. Some people will be saved, left behind, and others will be destroyed and swept away. And Jesus himself tells us that his return is unknown to all except God the Father. And then he commands the people to be ready because his return is unexpected. All that is to say that, I mean, I don't know how many times in the course of history, but it's been many since the church in Thessalonica, that people have tried to predict exactly when Jesus is going to return. These texts seem to indicate to us that the only one who knows is God the Father. So trying to predict when Jesus' return is not particularly encouraged in Scripture. Jesus is going to return when the Father says so. And so all we need to do is remain thankful and ready. And so our hope and death in this passage is founded on Jesus' return to earth, which is personal for all people and a public event for the entire world to experience and see. But when Jesus returns, the effects effects of this return will be eternal or permanent as he consummates his kingdom for all time and judges the world, which leads us to part three of this message and Jesus' return is permanent Christ's return brings all things and all of history to its proper and purposed conclusion. And we as people are going to celebrate his return with a, with a great reunion of sorts, a great parade. The souls in heaven who've lived their existence in this conscious state of purity, praise, peace, and pining will be resurrected. And at the front of the crowd, 
following Christ back to earth to recreate and judge the world. Back to the text from verse 16 till the end, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You see, verse 17 here says that the believers will meet the Lord in the air. And in the ancient world, this particular word used in the Greek for meeting the Lord in the air always refers to people going out from a city to meet a dignitary or a king and escorting the king back, you see. Escorting the king back. That's how this word is used in its three occurrences in the New Testament and in the ancient Greek world. It doesn't mean they go out to meet him and then they take off and go somewhere else. They come back is what this word means, you see. The word isn't used in the Bible to denote leaving, but it always denotes meeting and returning. You know, thus it seems because of that, you follow me? It seems because of that, what Paul's trying to communicate is that some secret return of Christ in which Christ takes the church away isn't isn't what Paul's saying here, right? It's a visible, public return of Jesus to the earth with permanent effects and great fanfare and glory. The church will suffer through the persecution as it's done throughout redemptive history, but God's people will remain faithful and meet the Lord in the air to usher in and parade Him back to the earth as their great judge and king. Friends, Paul wrote this passage specifically to comfort those who were grieving death by connecting the confession of the creed, Jesus Christ died and rose again with the reality of the resurrection of all the dead. Do you see? That's why this text is properly located at funeral homes, memorial services, and gravesides. In fact, I just recited this text at a funeral interment of a dear friend this past fall. It was the first snow of the year. We didn't talk about a temporary state of affairs. We didn't talk about some secret return of Christ. We pondered with great hope the glory of God at Christ's return to bring the faithful home from their exile to a permanent place of great peace and joy and uncompromised justice here on earth. And this text is placed in all of our hands to comfort others as much as ourselves in our time of great need. The picture presented here is the royal return of the king with the church as the official delegation to go out and meet the Lord and follow him back into earth to make everything right. You see, when Jesus returns to earth on the clouds, it's going to be final. I can see my dad. I could see my father-in-law leading the procession. And so many, of us, so many of us have friends and family that we've lost to death, that, are, that died in faith, that will be returning and leading this parade back to the earth, you see. The one coming of Christ is envisioned by Paul in this text, friends, which will unite the kingdom with the king and the king with his subjects forever. What a glorious hope we have. Be encouraged. Jesus is coming back. Three applications for this text and then we'll be done. I think I'm under 30 minutes here. <laughs> That's new for me, but I got a lot in these applications, so stay tuned. <laughs> Firstly, what, what a great, this passage is a great invitation to believe. If you're in the crowd and you're uncertain about death and you're thinking about Jesus and you're curious, you know, what is this Christian thing? And you're scared about death. You don't need to be scared. Come to Jesus by faith, friends. If you're uncertain about this future, right, you see the poverty of viewing death or life after death as just pure speculation. You don't have to believe that. 
You can come to Jesus Christ and repent and believe and be certain that when Jesus returns, you're going to be part of that parade and live eternally in a glorified body on this recreated earth here on earth. But there's going to come a time when Christ does return, when he's going to judge all of us. And then your time to repent and believe will be over. So what are you waiting for? Believe. Believe the gospel, friend. Come to faith today. Secondly, the certainty of Jesus' return to earth informs how we live in the present. What would our world be like if we kept Jesus' return to earth constantly, constantly in our hearts and minds? Not just in theory, but practically. You know, just imagine it. For this heavenly mindset can result in us living forward with both our hands and our hearts in the explosive power of the future. We've talked about that in our class on heaven a, a number of different times, so some of this is redundant for you that have come. We're free in Christ. We're free to live without guilt. Free to ponder daily life in the future as promised. Free to be happy with real hope in a hard time of sorrow on this earth. We can live out the future reality today in the present. And that means that we don't have to approach, you know, we don't have to approach death being scared. We can approach death and dying head on. Because we know it's not our final circumstance, right? When you have faith in Christ, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to run from death and pretend that it isn't going to happen to us. Let's ponder Jesus' return and the consummation of the kingdom of God upon it every day of our lives. Third and finally, because justice is certain when Christ returns, we can live out our lives here on earth in mission and in love. Justice will be served when Jesus returns. All the wrongs will be made right when Jesus returns. All the times that we've stumbled across somebody and sinned against him or they've sinned against us. All, everything is made right when Jesus returns. And the morality that we seek from our world, we can show them by the confidence that we share by living out the truth of the gospel ourselves today. Now, I was preparing for this message. This is the final part. As I was preparing for the message today, I came across this wonderful piece, uh, article from the Gospel Coalition that struck me in this regard. And I was so very encouraged by our campus outreach partners in this, mess, in this particular article, you know, hearing from one of their own. Listen to this testimony from Mason Jones, who's one of campus outreach's newest staff members. He just graduated and apparently took a staff position at Western Michigan University. Listen to this. When I began to grapple with the gospel, I discovered how Christ's cross both affirms and revolutionizes the concept of objective morality. It alone provided the tools I needed to address the problem. Christianity affirms the reality of an absolute moral standard, but it denies this standard is set by some arbitrary measure. Rather, it's based on God's own objective moral perfection as demonstrated through Christ's life, death, and resurrection. But there's more. I was also confronted with the practical, lived reality of the gospel in my friends' lives. For the first time in my life, I developed deep, meaningful relationships with genuine Christians, and the testimony of their lives validated the Bible's testimony. In many ways, there's nothing extraordinary about them. In fact, their faith often seems superficial to me, but even so, they showed me a radically different way of understanding morality. Real hope lived out of our relationships in loving our neighbors and friends and mission. You see, friends, we can be moral and truthful without being overly theoretical. While clearly a thoughtful guy, I mean, this Mason, you know, this, this gentleman, I don't happen to know him, but Mason Jones, he was a philosophy major in college. It's probably why he used so many big words in this. <laughs> what he's basically saying is, is you don't have to get, I didn't, it wasn't the theory. It wasn't the big words. It wasn't the profound discussion that sold me, right? It was the ethics of the Bible and the way the campus outreach Christians lived and shared their lives with me. And we can validate the testimony of Scripture and the reality of cross and Jesus' return with the way we witness too. We can be hopeful 
in life and death. We can be extraordinary without being extraordinary in the world's eyes at all. And we can do it together by maintaining a heavenly mindset with our eyes and hopes fixed on the return of Jesus Christ, our King.